Good day, everyone. Today we continue speaking about the Romantic movement. Uh, we are done with the Romantic uh, poets. We finished uh, Blake, Coleridge, William Wordsworth, John Keats, uh, Marlowe, Marlowe, Byron, Shelley, and Byron. Marlowe is not a Romantic uh, poet. Although he speaks about women, courtly love. Remember, romantic poetry is not about women. It's not about love relationships between men and, and, and women. It's about you know, nature. It's about loving yourself. It's about individuality and all these interesting uh, themes. Today, we move to speak about two women poets, two romantic, sorry, uh, two women uh, writers, authors female romantic uh, authors. The first one is Mary Shelley. The second one is Jane Austen. And before I begin, there are two things I have to, uh, to discuss. The first, Mary Shelley is Percy Shelley's wife. OK? Despite the fact, and this is very interesting, despite the fact that her parents, especially her mom, played a great role in developing Mary's uh, uh, skills as a writer, as a thinker, as a critic, as an essayist, she's usually uh, attributed to her husband because her husband's family name is used here, not her uh, parents, her original family name. And this is something some women resist most of the time. And here in Gaza, the laws were changed a little bit. Now a, wo a woman can choose to take her husband's name or to keep her own name. In America, sometimes they do double. Like, she keeps her name, her family name, and she also uses her husband's, like Hillary Rodham Clinton. So Clinton is the family name of the husband, and uh, uh, Rodham is her own uh, surname. And wh what I'm saying here is that sometimes women's success is generally attributed not to themselves, or to their parents, or particularly to their mom, but to her husband, to a man who was behind her. It's like every, there is a man behind every great woman supporting her and pushing and pushing her. And this is really anti-feminist in a way or, or another. The other thing is the fact that Jane Austen is considered by many people, my, many readers and critics to be a Victorian figure or rather a pre-Victorian uh, uh, figure. Here we're going to discuss uh, Jane Austen as a figure who was in between. She was the transitioning link between Romanticism and, and Vic the Victorian age. In her novels, we'll see themes and interests and concerns from the rom Romantic era, Romantic uh, period, and also she was preparing the scene for the Victorian, Victorian theme. So if someone tells you, no, no, she is Victorian, okay, they have a point. If someone says she is, no, she's pure Romantic, they also have a point, in my opinion, she is both. And sometimes it's not easy to clearly, uh, to give clear-cut answers whether somebody is Victorian or not, or romantic is not, because they could have common features from a particular movement, but also they could have their own individual personal uh, uh, features. Like when we discussed Byron, we said Byron returned back to Augustan age uh, idea of using irony and satire as tools in, in, in poetry, something that most of other romantics uh, just uh, didn't want to, to do. Okay? So, Mary Wollstonecraft, her original uh, family name, it's so huge, so big. It's a burden, right? And now she uses, or, or many people refer to her basically as. Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley. Shelley was, she was in a way, she has some critical opinions. She was an essayist. She was also a short story writer. But most importantly, she was a novelist. So uh, romanticism and the romantic movement was mainly a movement of poetry. But uh, prose was developed in so many ways, especially that some women were writing a prose. They always wanted to find different ways. They always wanted to experiment and to change the the techniques of men uh, telling stories. Uh, her most famous text is called Frankenstein. 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 It's described as a gothic 
novel. Gothic novel. And Gothic novels generally are novels that take place among the ruins of ancient buildings and castles and in forests and jungles. And sometimes there is an element of terror and fear and, and uh, 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 something that intimidates the readers that makes you feel that this is some, some sort of a scary movie in a way. Okay? But the, basically it happens among, you know, mysterious buildings with, you know, ancient uh, histories and everything. So this is basically what a gothic novel is. This is the basic definition. You can elaborate on that more. So Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Prometheus is the subtitle of the novel. It's uh, in ancient uh, Greece or Greek mythology, Prometheus brings the fire from heaven, from somewhere, to men. And he was punished by the gods because fire was not supposed to be to given to men. So what uh, Prometheus does is to break the rules of the gods, to break the rules, the barriers, and to bring something to humanity, which is fire. For many, he, fire is the, probably the most significant invention ever. What happens in the story is that someone by the name of uh, Victor Frankenstein, so who's Victor Frankenstein? He's the, the main character, he's the protagonist, the hero, so to speak. He's a scientist, a student at university. Doing a lot of research and experimentations, Victor Frankenstein discovers the secret of life. You know, the secret of life, because no matter what humanity does, it will not be able to give life to a dead body. It's impossible. This is only the work of God. So, because you know, using electricity and some technological and technological scientific advances, Victor discovers the secret of life. What does he do? He's between, you know, he's like caught between two options here: to compete with God, you know, to be remember uh, Dr. Faustus. He wanted to be as powerful as God, to know everything and do everything possible. So he chooses to go into this path of trying to create something, somebody. So he goes to a cemetery, to a graveyard, and he collects body parts from dead people. A head from here, a torso from here, a hand from here, a leg from here, and he attaches them together, and he uses uh, the, yeah, he stitches the, the body parts together, and he breathes life, life into this creature. He gives it life using technology and science. Oh, interesting, right? Of course, this is called science fiction. We'll, say, we'll see in a bit what science fiction means. It's impossible in real life. But in science fiction novels, they tell us about how science sometimes in the future, like in 3020, or people on Mars, or aliens coming here. This is what basically a science fiction novel uh, does it's about what science can do that uh, people can't really imagine in real life, like how science can uh, reach out to other planets or other, you know, peoples on Mars or other, on Jupiter or other uh, uh, planets out there, or how people can move in time and place, you know, time machines and everything. I know some people who hate science fiction. They say, oh, I don't believe this. It's impossible for people to travel across time and place in like very short uh, periods of time. It's, it's difficult to go back in time. But remember, science fiction is some of the most interesting, imaginative, and creative writing ever. And according to many, science fiction has given people and scientists and uh, technology a lot of ideas. I remember like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when we would m watch a movie where a policeman holds, for example, uh, some sort of a TV or a screen and would use, you know, t touch things and move things with fingers. Many people are like, what? Like you touch a screen and everything moves and now it's everything in our lives is, uh, is touch screen. This started decades ago in, in science fiction. So this is basically about science doing the impossible. Okay, so who's the main character? Victor Frankenstein. The novel is named after him. Now, he creates a being, sometimes referred to as a creature, being, and he created. 
like you know, like like a god. Uh, the this creature is referred to as a monster. As a monster, many people think that Frankenstein refers to this creature or being or monster. No, it actually refers to the scientist, the, scientist, the main character, Victor Frankenstein, and the creature remains unnamed throughout the whole novel. It doesn't have a name, and which is too sad. It's too sad. Can you live without a name? No. Can you go on in life and people are calling you, hey, you, hey, something. You have a name, and when people call you, hey, you, or something. You say I have you, a name. Yeah, yeah, excuse me, I have a name. Uh, a being, or woman, hey, woman, come on. Yeah, I am a woman, I'm proud of that, but I have a name, call me by. My name. So don't mix this. If in the exam I ask you, I say that true or false, uh, the main character is the creature named Frankenstein, it's no. wrong. And it's actually one of the sad things. Now, when the creature wakes up, comes to life, he looks so ugly, so to speak, because of the stitches, because of the body parts, and instead of taking care of this creature, as a, I don't know, a baby, or as a machine you create, you invent, Victor Frankenstein runs away. He abandons this creature, and he runs away, and the creature gets very angry, very sad, learns to speak, learns to read, learns to do many interesting things by, by itself or himself, because it is treated as, as a thing. Yes? Yeah, yeah, exactly, in a way, like, you don't have to take it literally people giving life to dead bodies. Like, robots nowadays could be like, you know, Sophia? You know, yeah. Sophia, the robot that talks? Yeah. Very intelligent. In a way, it looks like. And we have so many movies, science fiction movies, about ro robots, you know, controlling their own lives and destinies and rebelling against human beings because of, of something, abuse or, or something. So, now, the monster... I don't like to say the monster, but it is described in the book as a monster. Comes to Victor, says, Victor, you created me. You should take care of me. He says, no, go away. Go away. You are hideous. He says, okay, create something else. Create a wife so I can, you know, have a company, companion, and we can go to the mountains. We'll not bother anybody. He says, he starts to do, to have to do something about it, and then he stops. He destroys the, the other creature, the female creature he was uh, creating. He gets angry. He kills his brother. He kills, like, several, causes the, the deaths of several people. He kills his Victor's wife. wife, the night of the wedding. And he kills Victor Frankenstein himself. Now, what is interesting about this novel is original in many ways. It's one of the first science fiction novels. It's one of the earliest Gothic novels in English literature. But also, the narrative of the story is experimental and original. Only, generally, women, men were doing the same thing again and again and again. Yes, we have a lot of experimentation, like, you know, remember Tristram Shandy, Shandy Lawrence Stern? But in, women usually wanted to be different, to prove, to make a point, to prove that they can write better than men, than men and that's why they did an amazing job uh, uh, in this regard. So the, the novel starts with uh, Victor, I think, was Victor and his, his sister exchanging letters. So it's epistolary in a way, you know, epistolary using epistles, letters. And then we shift to listen to the story. We see everything through the, eye, the mind and the eyes and the perspective of Victor. And at the end of the book, in a very surprising way, the narrative, the narration shifts where we come face to face with the monster and we listen to his story. And it's very beautiful, because generally in stories, like in Robinson Crusoe, we don't listen to Friday talking unfiltered. He talks in the story, but who tells us what he said, what he didn't say? The it's the narrator, it's Robinson Crusoe himself. But here, we come face to face with the, uh, with the monster, with the creature, and he tells us, and we feel so sad and so sorry for him. We sympathize with him. In a way, we identify with him. He's like, I was alone. He kept me. He abandoned me. I was like Adam. If God didn't take care of Adam, he would turn up into uh, something, some kind of a, a monster. He, he, I asked just to create a female companion. I wanted company. I wanted to talk to people. He didn't even give me a name. And then 
the creature runs away and disappears in, in the snow. Really beautiful a novel if you are into Gothic and uh, science, science fiction. In, in many ways, this is an experimental original uh, 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 novel. Now, what is romantic about this? We'll see, again, so Frankenstein is an experimental in its uh, novel, in its structure and narrative form, the way it's built, the way it is told uh, 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 to us. The fact that there is a shift in the, narr in the narrative mode and we come face to face with the antagonist, with the bad guy, and then we realize, wait, wait a minute, the bad guy is not that bad at all. Or at least, of course, we never justify murder. We don't say, yeah, Victor deserves to die, his wife deserves to die, everybody else deserves to die. No, we don't justify murder at all, but at least we try to understand. He has a strong uh, some, yeah, not justifiable again, but we ask ourselves, would we do the same thing or similar things if we were in his shoes? I know his shoes are big, but would we be reacting in the same way or a similar way, in a way or another? Hopefully not, but who knows? So the novel has romantic and anti-romantic features. The, the, the idea that, remember imagination, there is a lot about nature, imagination, individuality, and the ordinary people. But also here, Mary Shelley is saying that it's very dangerous to totally depend on your imagination. Imagination that is not at least, uh, I would say, controlled a little bit, controlled in a way where man should know the limits. It's very dangerous. And this is the result. You destroy yourself, you create things that will be destructive. And we've seen this in science, uh, science making viruses, uh, scientists making diseases sometimes, in a way or another. But again, it shows the romantic interest in nature and the super, supernatural. It shows the attempts of man to be as powerful as, as God. We ha we've seen this in Shakespeare, we've seen this in Marlowe, and it's repeated here. So again, this is one, uh, like, like I say here, one of the first modern science fiction novels. What is science fiction? This is, again, simply speaking. We see many movies, many movies about uh, science fiction and, and books. Uh, stories about events, sometimes in the future, which are affected by imaginary developments in, in science. However, some of these imaginary developments can sometimes become a reality in a way or another, such as traveling in time or other planets with life. On them. So this is basically Frankenstein. This is Mary Shelley, a woman writer. She, by the way, she was one of the people who supported her husband. It's not the other way. We, when we get uh, to hear Mary Shelley, oh, her husband must have helped her. She, he, he could have done this to her. He could have made her famous. In a way, she was there to help him. Her mother was a significant uh, player in her. Okay, any question about Frankenstein, Mary Shelley? Do you, like, do you like science fiction? Does anybody here like to watch science fiction movies? What do you like about it? Uh, that in the future maybe we can inspire from them trying to do something new. Okay, inspiration, new. What else? Yes. I like science fiction because uh, you know, it gives us hope for the future, but I don't like science, uh, time traveling because it doesn't make sense for me. Listen, my, remember, Coleridge, Coleridge here comes in handy, where we need to suspend our, you know, uh, disbelief. You know, it's impossible. But remember, in the past, in the past, yeah, like in the past, it would take you months to move from, I don't know, London to somewhere in Asia, somewhere in Europe even. And now you can just do it in two, three, five hours. In a way, this is some sort of, you know, it's traveling, it's not time traveling. It's just about speed. And you, you know, it's a speed, yeah. So I'm not saying, I don't believe that in the future we will be able to travel in time or to travel, you know. What, what is it called in Harry Potter? Operating, operating, is it operating? When, when they move from one place to another and using the fire and the powder. Oh, I forgot how to put that. But 
I don't think people can. Oh, remember Hermione? It was it in book one or book two? She also moved the particular device she had to turn, to turn time, time turner device. But again, we use our imagination here. We disable this logic a little bit just to see what's going on. There is a movie called Translator, I guess. Translator, where someone, they bring a translator to talk to some of the aliens. A very beautiful one. I love the movie, especially, I love movies where you have uh, things about English and literature and, and like the dead poet society. You should watch this movie, a lot of inspiration. It's dark a little bit. But again, I love how when an alien comes from I don't know where, and they go to someone who teaches translation, who is specialized in translation, come, translate for us. We, because it's mad, it's crazy, because it's impossible. But I laugh because I identified with this. Many people are like regularly like say, uh, hey, uh, do you have a minute? I say, yeah, I have a class in 10 minutes. And they say, can you translate these three pages for me? And I'm like, but this is untranslatable. It's almost, sometimes almost impossible to translate stuff. A friend of mine asked me to translate Lan Nafiya Lil Jin, Sulam Il Muzahlaqa, all these Arabic, uh, Im, almost, Im, how would you translate Lam Il Muzahlaqa? So seriously, in many ways, I felt this connection between me and the translator. Like, hey, translators can't do anything. Come, translate, because there is an alien talking to us. So it could be about, you know, things we experience on a different level, a different scale. But Einstein, one of the theories of Einstein, say that we can travel in time if we are in the time uh, be equal with the speed. Uh, but at this moment, uh, at least at this moment, uh, no one of the scientists uh, can prove that uh, the time could uh, be equal with the speed. Yeah, probably. Einstein uh, think that we can. It's possible. I'm not Einstein, of course. Uh, and if he says so, it could be true. But who knows? Maybe in the future, in, in 50 years, in 100 years, in 1,000 years. How could uh, so, uh, one person be in both places, you know, in the yeah. future, and, uh, in the present, and in the past? Yeah, crazy. Maybe he's dead. Crazy. I don't know. I'm not a scientist myself. I just, I just talk. You won't let me. Uh, no, yes. I was saying that science fiction makes us think when you watch a movie that uh, creates a new idea and you start thinking, oh, this may be possible, and you start thinking about other things, think, you know. So it's, it's it brings a, a whole train of thoughts. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with Haya here. It's about thinking, it's about imagination, it's about the power of imagination and what you can do, what is possible and what is impossible. Anyway, if you don't like science fiction, at least try to disable the logic according to what we heard from uh, Coleridge, the suspension of disbelief. Take it uh, as a metaphorical expression, as an allegory. Because listen, uh, Beowulf itself is not, it's not, it's not, it's not also, it's, it's magical also. Because we know dragons don't exist. We know one man can dive, I don't know how long, deep in the lake and fight the dragons and the monsters. We know this. But we take this in, on an allegorical, metaphorical level. Cartoon, cartoon doesn't exist. Do we have cartoon characters in real life? Why do we enjoy Tom and Jerry? Why do you enjoy the Smurfs? Do you watch the Smurfs? Yeah, Did you watch the movie uh, uh, Cuckoo? Yeah, cool. Whoa, what a beautiful and brave and uh, what else? Uh, Entangled. What other cartoon movies do we have uh, uh, nowadays? Romanzen. Yeah, really beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful movies. So, SpongeBob. Oh, some SpongeBob fans here. Good. So my point is that why would you like cartoon? Is cartoon real? Does it teach us something? Does it touch our hearts? Yeah. It's not only about the fun and the laughter like we see in Tom and Jerry. Although, listen, Tom and Jerry is probably the most violent thing on TV. It's always fighting, always, you know, uh, Tom cutting somebody, uh, his, uh, Jerry cuts uh, his tail, sometimes his head, sometimes, you know, detonates the whole house. A lot of violence. We laugh. We don't pay much attention to the violence. 
and we know it's not real, but we love sometimes to suspend even our belief in real life because we want something called a relief, you know? We want a break. We want some fun sometimes. Anyway, interesting how significant literature is and fiction is. Now, Jane Austen, remember? Yeah. Jane Austen could be a transition link between romanticism and, and Victorian age. If you want to take Jane Austen as a, as a, as a Victorian figure, it's up to you. You want to take her as a, a romantic figure, it's, it's also up to you. But definitely she has themes and features and characteristics from both movements and, uh, and eras. And she was one of the most important writers of her time. But always remember that Jane Austen was only one of a long series or chain of female writers, beginning from uh, Afra Ben, for example. Afra Ben uh, will probably mention this. I mentioned this already, and I'll mention it again and again. Uh, Virginia Woolf, the most significant female critic and feminist uh, activist and writer in the 20th century, praises Afra Ben of all women. She says all the women in the world should put roses on her grave. Right? Yeah. She started this movement. She encouraged women to, women to write. She showed the women how how, how to write. But again, about, personally, I would go to female characters all the time. I'll go to the nun in Chaucer's story and see how she defies the rule of man. I'll go to, to Portia as one of the greatest female characters ever, how she tried, she mocked, she made fun of the man-made rules and patriarchy only by changing her, her, her gown, her clothes, by putting a particular uh, garment and now she's a lawyer and now she can beat the court, deceive the court and can uh, deceive the most cunning character in Shakespeare, Shylock. So it starts from literature but it then transfers into, into real life. Okay, so she's a late romantic, pre-Victorian uh, figure or a romantic and a Victorian uh, figure. Her, more, her main interests usually go to uh, the moral, the social, and the psychological. If we focus on the social, generally this is a Victorian issue theme because it's always about the society, corruption, and poverty, and children, and education, etc. Now, again, I don't want to say that women writers mainly write about women, but they do, okay? But it doesn't mean all their writing is about women and women themes. They have a variety of issues and a variety of, of themes, but of course, because women are like here, most Palestinian poets and writers in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, in the diaspora, they write about Palestine. But not everything we write is about Palestine. Sometimes we write as Palestinians, we write like Palestinians. But you could write any kind of, of poetry or uh, novels or short story. So she writes mainly about young her heroines who grow up to search for, independently, to search for personal happiness where they try to turn things upside down and inside out. So women are no longer totally or dependent on men. on men. They are independent. So her pictures are usually very vivid, very detailed. She describes things in minute description that sometimes men can, uh, can do. So she uses irony to show how absurd things, uh, things are. And Something interesting about Austin, she doesn't include too many characters in her, in her novels. She just chooses three or four uh, families, uh, three or four main characters, and that's it. Many movies, like, uh, sorry, novels later on have tens and dozens of characters, and it, it could be confusing. Her point is that I just want to focus on these, and they can represent the whole society, the whole society. Okay? Now, in, in her box, we'll see, for example, how characters, how she gives the characters the choices. And readers are generally involved in the experience. We'll see how this happens later on. So the reader, when you read, especially Jane Austen, sometimes you feel as a character in the book. You identify everything is revealed in front of you. Characters have options, have choices. 
and they d decide which option to take and you just want to follow them to see what happens eventually because you also have your own choices in, uh, in life and how they make these. For example, in, in Sense and Sensibility, as the name suggests, notice how the name changes. It's, not, it's no longer a name after the main character. We have, this, we have this more in women than in men, by the way. Okay, so sense and sensibility. Well, she contrasts between sense and sensibility, the Augustan age of mind and control and brain, and of emotions and feelings and imagination, the romantic, the romantic age. So she contrasts between two sisters, Eleanor, who is rational and self-controlled, representing sense, the brain, and Marianne, who is more emotional, standing for sensibility, standing for, again, the Romantic Age versus the Augustan, the Augustan Age. Interesting how, again, as a woman, she's involved in this uh, uh, idea of comparing and contrasting ages together. So this is something critics did at that time, but she does this in her, in her novel. In, in Pride and Prejudice, and Emma, so we have Pride and sensibility, sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Emma, and Mansfield Park. She usually shows that it's important to know oneself in order to achieve happiness, what, what, what we want to do. So generally, she focuses on this aspect of self-identifying yourself, knowing yourself, understanding yourself. Do you want to achieve happiness? Do you want to be something? Do you want to be different? Do you want to change your society, to change somebody, to get somebody, to win somebody? Do you want to do that? First and foremost, you have to come face to face with yourself and to understand what exactly you are, who you are, what you want, understanding your identity. Remember, we spoke about this in Hamlet also. At the beginning, Hamlet didn't know did he belong to the old age of his father, asking him to commit suicide, or to the new modern age where he goes to university and knows that a person who kills should be arrested and taken by the police, and then to be or not to be, that is the question. And at the end, when he realizes who he is, he changes from to be or not to be to, it's I, Hamlet, the Dane. He knows that, okay, I know who I am, and I know what I want to do in life. So this is significant in her books. Understand yourself. And remember, this is generally something that the reader feels. The message is clear because you are involved in, 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 in the book. Okay? But again, her novels, and most of the novels of these times, because many people wanted to please the readers. They wanted to publish, because publishers wanted a particular uh, type of genre of novels, so they would end uh, happily uh, ever after with generally people getting getting married. But a significant aspect in Jane Austen, and this we find this more often in women writers than in men, where the reader is involved in a way or another. The reader is part of, you identify, you are addressed sometimes, for example, in, Sin -Sin -Sin -Sin, in Pride and Prejudice, we'll see at the end of the novel, the main character, I think Elizabeth Bennet will see now, she directly talks to the reader and she says, reader, I married, is it here? No, sorry, uh, this, is, uh, this is in Jane Eyre, not here. Jane Eyre, sorry, I, I messed up. So here the reader again is part of the experience itself, part of, of the novel. Before we conclude romant romanticism, we'll speak a little bit more about pride and prejudice. There are many movies Pride and Prejudice. There, there was a movie like five years ago, seven years ago. Yes. Really interesting stuff. Uh, I know many people who don't want to read romantic novels from the Romantic Age or even Victorian novels. They, they think that they're big and boring. So at least try to watch the movie and then try to read uh, the, the novel. Uh, now Pride and Prejudice begins with one of the most famous openings in literature. The first line says, it is, a universal, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. 
if you are rich, if you have money, you should get married. If you have this, if you are rich, if you are single, have the money, all you need now to complete yourself in a way is a wife. So it is a, a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in one of all. This is the opening line, the first sentence from Pride and Prejudice. Now several people say this is ironic. They say this is a famous irony because it's the opposite, the opposite happens. Because generally here, it's the woman who is in the society is in want of a man. Because in the book, the women start to chase, or one of the women starts to chase the rich character. So it's like a woman who is single should be looking for a man who has money. And there are other layers of or of ironies. So in Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth Bennett, this is her name, she's a central uh, character. She dislikes Mr. Darcy. He is wealthy and he is in want of, of a wife, of a woman or, or a wife. Now because she hates him, simply because she hates him, because of who he is, she is prejudiced. No prejudice to dislike somebody or something before even getting to know them. Just you have an idea, generally unrealistic, unfounded. And the man, because he's rich, he's full of himself, he's pride. He's proud. He's a proud man. He is pride. He stands for, for what? She's prejudiced while he is pride because she dislikes him at the beginning and he's full of himself. Now, the, again, remember the characters have to learn about themselves, to know themselves, to understand themselves before getting to achieve what they have. Uh, to achieve, and as expected from uh, Jane Austen, the novel ends happily. What is happiness here in the society? Married. They get married. Uh, Elizabeth marries Mr. Darcy. She loves him. Say again. She loves him. Uh, but not at the beginning, right? Yeah. yeah. She really realized at the end that he is the true man. He's a he's a good man, but why? She so this is this is the journey of understanding, self exploration, seeking to understand yourself. Watch the movie, it's really interesting. Try to read uh, uh, the book. So the happy ending here is, this is a social movie in a way or another. Sorry, a social novel about society, about marriage, about men, about women, and everything. Okay, that's uh, Pride and Prejudice, very famous uh, novel. So we come to a conclusion here, romanticism in general. We have, again, how many male poets? Wordsworth. Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, Keats Shelley, Byron. and Byron. Keith. And then we have Jane Austen, Jane Austen and? Do they all share the same exact features? No. This applies to almost all movements and theories in English. Wrong. Generally, we have basic general features and characteristics that most of them share, and then each one of them has their or its hair or his uh, particular uh, features. We've seen this once and again, but basically, the romantic poets, the romantic authors in general, they were writers, poets of change. Yes, not radical, political, social change at the beginning, but at least changing language, changing the way poetry was composed. They were. They found constants in nature. nature and art. Remember Coleridge, supernatural elements. Uh, Wordsworth, nature, the daffodils, the rainbow. Yeah. And in the common man, simple language, memory. But later on, for Keats and Shelley, for example, art was the end. Art was not only the means to an end, but also the end itself, because art and artistic creation give meaning and give eternity and give life and they make our lives and experiences now and, and forever.
They could also see the dangers in the modern world. Remember the society, the corruption of the city, depersonalization and decline. People were no longer people. They were like machines working in factories. They wanted to give man back his dignity. Like, and that's the feature of individuality uh, here. In their writings, the security of the individual was threatened. The individual was losing his or her identity. And that's why we find generally the common people, the masses, themes about ordinary people, poor people, unnamed people, people we never ever find in the texts, the books the, of the Augustans generally. Be that, because basically it was about you know, elite life and courtly life, Be more or less, not 100%. So during the Romantic period, prose writing developed rapidly thanks partly to some women writers, but also some uh, men. But always remember, poetry was more dominant. In the Victorian age, it's going to be the opposite. The novel will be more, more dom dominant. A number of novelists were women, such as Mary Shelley and Jane Austen. And thus, we finish the Romantic movement. Not sure how you think about it compared to the Augustan poetry, compared to uh, John Donne, compared to Chaucer, compared to Old English. But many, I know many, especially, uh, I was reading an, uh, this article that, that claims that the Romantics are more famous um, among women than among, than, than among men. Because the claim is that uh, romantic poetry literature gives voice to the subclass, the marginalized, like Jonan was doing, to people who nobody cares about. So when you read a poem as a woman, you feel empowered. You feel that someone is at least giving you a particular uh, tool, is creating, is inviting you to create your own world, to change your own world in a way, in a way or, or another. Okay. Do we have any question, comment, or something? Uh, can we consider Jane Austen as a, bit, as a, as a veteran writer of history of age? Yeah, could be. Yeah, she could be a veteran. Because she experienced, she lived during the, uh, you know, some romantic poets and later on with some Jane early, Victorian. early Victorians. Yeah, but not exactly, but could be. Yes? Commentary? Shayma? Asil, Dream, Khadra. Anyone? We don't have a Khadra here. Huh? Okay, we stop. Thank you very much. And looking forward to next class where we're going to begin talking about the Victorian age. And thank you very much. <laughs>